Hey guys, uh, let's get started. Let's get started with this lecture today. Before I start, uh, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, I don't know, you want to come here quickly and say whatever you have to say. Um, I don't. I don't actually have a script for it. I mean, I, I don't know what to say, so I'm just going to read it off my phone. So. Um, um, you have to shout into this thing. Um, so, so basically, um, I, I'm one of the uh, models for the UCD fashion show. Uh, it's. T <laughs> <laughs> um, it's for uh, today and tomorrow, and um, I'm am selling tickets. Um, the uh, the show is uh, in Ada Jigsaw, Jigsaw, which is a national center for youth mental health. Um, yeah, so you can get tickets from me at the end of the lecture, or uh, you can go to the SU shop and get them. Um, tickets are 12 euro for uh, students, and uh, for anyone else, it'll be 15 euro. And uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, fashion show apparently, you know? Guys, uh, this is uh, exciting to see what you are doing here. Um, okay, I had two other announcements. First of all, um, one correction. One correction to be made. Yesterday I had uploaded the second assignment uh, on Blackboard and there was a broken link. So I don't know if you figured that out, maybe you just haven't seen that yet. So actually I corrected that, so in case you downloaded the, the assignment yesterday, uh, there was a link in there which was broken, now the link is corrected. Yeah. Okay, and another announcement that I have, so um, at the last lecture we had some leftovers, you know, we talked about research design, you know, I started talking about experimental designs and I want to talk more about different kinds of designs, but um, I don't want to rush this, so uh, at the same time I want to get to something else today, so I will come back to that next week. Yeah. So next week on uh, Monday I will talk more about with a little more time about different kinds of research designs. Yeah. And a last announcement that I have for next week, there's going to be a second component in that. Uh, well, you know, I don't know about you, but that's sort of the time of the term, you know, it's getting a little hectic. Lots of stuff happens. Oh, there's a fashion show. Yeah. So there are all these things going on. Your life is busy and sometimes, you know, this is, this is where it's getting a little exhausting for you. So I'm aware of that. So during the next week, uh, I'll have a review session or more precisely, it's going to be a big quiz. Be surprised, I think you're going to love it. It's going to be a big quiz um, where that we'll also use to revisit some of the material. Yeah? So most likely that's going to happen on Wednesday next week. So, I don't know, normally you bring your phone, but I don't know, it's always good to have something like that. If you don't, I don't know, uh, next week, Wednesday, it would make a lot of sense to have either a computer or a tablet or a phone with you that connects to the internet. Yeah? Otherwise, you can't participate in it. Okay, so far about the announcements, so now let me get started with what I actually want to talk about today. So, you know, as I said, I want to move on, and when you look at the assignment, half of the assignment is about this, so that's sort of why I want to press ahead with that. Uh, and I want to talk about literature reviews and literature search. Yeah. I remember, I don't know, I talked about having research questions, and then I talked about this research process, and one of the first components that we had in there in this research process is doing a literature review yeah. and doing a literature search. And, and that's, that's pretty essential. It's pretty essential in all sorts of academic work, but even when you, when you do non-academic work, you need to uh, have a look at uh, what other people did, you need to uh, summarize their findings, you need to cite it correctly, so these kind of things. So that's sort of what today's lecture is all about. So I have these four topics that I brought with me. First of all, literature review in general. Um, then five steps how to go about doing a literature review. Then I want to talk more about citation and potentially about plagiarism as well. Okay, so that's the menu for today. Um, let's get started with literature review. Yeah. So what is a literature review? Well, essentially a literature review is you go out to the library or nowadays you, know, you don't have to physically go to the library anymore. Lots of stuff is online and to be honest, my, most of my work is online. All my research, the journal articles that I have, even books are online. Uh, so it makes our life much, much easier. But a literature review is uh, 
uh, basically, once you have identified your research question or questions you know, that you want to study in a research project, the next step is to search the existing literature. Now, what did other people do in this regard already? And chances are that somebody already did something in that regard. You know? And that's basically you like um, making a reference to that. Or first of all, for you to know what do we already know about a phenomena. Now, let's say you want to write something about uh, social inequality and health in Ireland. That's an important topic. Now, you want to do a research project about that. The first thing you do is you go out and actually look at who already worked on this. And chances are that somebody already worked on this. Actually, chances are that somebody probably wrote a PhD on this. That doesn't mean that what you're going to do is not going to be useful. Yeah? But actually, no, it's kind of finding, finding what others did and then taking it from there one step further. Yeah? And that's essentially what a literature review is. Kind of summarizing uh, the state of the art where we are right now. Yeah? This can be also the theories that are relevant for whatever you want to do, but also the existing empirical research. Basically, uh, articles or books about other studies that already uh, dealt with something. Yeah. So a literature review looks closely at uh, scholarly articles. You know, a lot of it nowadays works through periodicals, through journal articles. Now, if you want to make a career in sociology nowadays, you have to write journal articles. I'll talk more about it in, later on, and then i also tell you why. Um, but there are also books you know, and other sources that are relevant for a particular research question, you know, or an area of a research, or whatever you want to study uh, in, in that context. And the purpose is to offer an overview of significant literature published on the topic. Yeah, so it's pretty, pretty straight But let me nevertheless talk about what is the point of this. Yeah? So what are the things that you want to, what are the questions that guide you when you do a literature review? Well, first of all, you want to know what is already known about this area. Yeah? So we do know a lot of stuff, and it's actually hard to keep track of things. Even when you're in a very specific field, there are lots of people all over the world researching on, on different things. So who knows who else already uh, researched social inequality and health in Ireland? Yeah. Could be people all over the world. So you want to know what we already know in this area. Um, then you also want to know what are the concepts and theories that are relevant to this area. Yeah. So what are the theories that people dealt with when they thought about, okay, how can we explain social inequalities in Ireland? Yeah, in this case, you would actually zoom out a little bit and you would think, okay, hang on, the theories it doesn't necessarily matter that we are talking about Ireland here, but what did other people, uh, what are the other theories that people thought about or that they looked at when they, uh, when they investigate social inequalities and health? Yeah? You also want to know about how did other people do it? Yeah? What is the research method that they had? Did they go and do an experiment? Did they have a questionnaire, a survey? Did they use some existing data sets? And how did they analyze it? Which kind of method did they employ? Did they use simple descriptors? Did they use regression? Did they do content analysis? Whatever. And there are so many different options, right? So uh, you want to know about a particular field, how did other people study? Not just what do we know, but also how did they do it? Yeah. How did they come about knowing that uh, whatever they, they, they write in, in their publication? You want to know about what are the controversies? And believe it or not, there are lots of controversies. Sociology is full of controversies. And it's a, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare to navigate that, especially when you teach first year students. But um, you want to know what are the discussions that people have. And remember that, that I said we are not always, you know, there's a slightly different thinking in a way. It's, um, sometimes we just don't agree. Yeah. Some people say that, it's, that, I don't know, this theory explains social inequalities and health in Ireland. Other people say something else explains it. There could be a, a debate going on. There could be a controversy going on. This controversy could be, I don't know, on a substantive ground. It could be on a theoretical ground. It could be on a methodological ground. Some people say, this is how, if you, if you study if you study this phenomena, you can't use that method. While other people say, well, but, but what you do is not that great. Right? And that's sort, of how, that's sort of how we improve. That's sort of how we, how we go forward, you know, that, uh, that serious epidemics have serious uh, controversies and debates. Yeah? And that's sort of ultimately how, how progress is being made. Yeah? So, I don't know, for me, the worst thing is when I go to a conference and represent something and everybody, everybody just agrees with what I say. It's, it's, it's really bad because then, I don't know, what's the point of it? How can I, how can I improve? Yeah? How can I get 
get further. And that's sort of kind of a mindset that, that I would encourage you to have. Okay, are there in, any inconsistencies in the findings related to this area so far? Yeah. Maybe people found something that just looks a little off. Yeah. Remember how I talked about research questions and puzzles and so on, and I had already mentioned that uh, doing um, a literature review or based on existing research, you can find a puzzle, something that is off. So this is where a literature review is very, very useful as well, to find something that just doesn't fit. Yeah or something that we haven't, uh, uh, haven't been able to, to explain properly. So, um, so we have these questions, and then we want to go further. Yeah? We want to take the next step. That's sort of how we make progress in the sciences, you know, and in social sciences as well. We, we look at where is the research from here, and then you want to go one step further. So when I have, so currently I'm, I'm supervising these master's students, and. Now, I'm really pushing them very hard to think about where is the research frontier at this particular moment. Yeah? Really go to that. Really go to the very specifics of what people are publishing about right now, what is sort of the current state of the art, and then you go one step further. Yeah? Even if it's just a tiny step. That's sort of how it is. Sometimes it's just really, really a tiny step. But that's sort of like the incremental improvement and how we, how we, uh, how we get better, how we uh, make a contribution to the discipline. And, to, uh, and, and more generally as well. Yeah? So, so going to the research frontier and then going one step further. And in order to go there, you need to know what is out there. So that's the point of the literature review. Um, but not just from an academic point of view. You know, let's say most of, most of you guys, let's face it, are not going to go down an academic career, although I hope that some of you will. Uh, but you know, for some people, they end up in companies, end up working for the governments or whatnot. And, and then one task is, to report uh, or to keep people up to date about what is the current state in the field. Yeah. What you do, you do a literature review. And you scan basically what did folks like, what did academics, people like me and my colleagues, what are we currently saying about social inequalities and health in Ireland? Yeah. Okay, but a literature review is basically uh, building on the shoulders of giants. I had mentioned that before, you know, that's a quote from Robert K. Merton. Uh, and the idea is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you don't have to start from scratch again. Just basically look at what other people did, what they found, know where the debates are, and then stand on the top of that and look further ahead. Yeah? So even when it's just a tiny little bit, you're still higher than the giant. Uh, another important thing about literature reviews is also that when you when you um, when you do your own research. Now let's say I do a research project. I'm going to talk a little more about that. Currently, I'm doing a research project with a student of obesity and social networks. Uh, like I don't know why are uh, overweight people friends with other overweight people? Why are underweight people friends with underweight people? And we do a literature review in that context. And this connects our work with previous knowledge, debates, and controversies. Right? So we make a link from us to them. Because often, I don't know, people don't really know who is interested in that, but through these references, and talk more about references, uh, by bringing people into my literature review and talking about their work, I make the link between my work and their work. And, uh, but it also goes in the other way around, so that then you know we kind of you make yourself uh, visible to the other people that do research in that field. And nowadays it works very nicely. You know, you, I don't know, you get alerts when somebody cites you, and somebody I don't know, somebody uh, uh, read my work and, and uses it in their work. Then I get a ref I get basically a notification, and and that allows me oh hang on maybe we should do something together at some point, yeah? or maybe we should collaborate on something else, or we seem to have common research interests. So it connects your work with that of others, especially in the academic discipline, that's important. But you know, as I said, also uh, literature reviews um, allow us to learn from mistakes, here in the case of the mistake of others. Uh, so you, do a, you scan the literature on a particular topic, and you, you read it, and then you see, okay, what did they do wrong? What can I do better now? If you don't know what other people did, if you haven't done your search on how they, what they published about their work, you cannot learn from their mistakes because you don't know what they did. You, know? you don't know about their mistakes. Um, but also, you know, we had that before already when I talked about uh, research questions and research gaps. You know? 
uh, that's another way the literature review is, is, is very, very important. It, it helps you identify the research gap. Uh, you see what people wrote or how they wrote about social inequality and health in Ireland. Yeah? But then you realize nobody, nobody, nobody looked at social networks in that context. Yeah? Nobody looked at people's friendship relationships. So they looked at, I don't know, people's sort of class background, people's salary or whatnot. Uh, and they looked at health outcomes, but they didn't, they didn't consider that um, um, the friends that you have matter greatly for how your health is going to be. Now, and actually, there's research, there's another literature that actually shows that. Right? But in this case, it could be, hang on, the research gap here is that people didn't really think about this, these networks in the context of inequalities in health, for example. Yeah? So literature review, basically you go out, you kind of look for what other people wrote about it, while at the same time, you kind of, it also helps you to find what people haven't wrote about. Yeah? Or where people are actually often, you know, in a, in, a research, in a good research article at the end, there's a limitation section, uh, which basically tells you that uh, this is what people did, but they couldn't do everything. This is something that somebody else should do. Yeah. And then you can basically build on that. So when I'm supervising a student, that's sort of the best thing that can happen, that the student has a clear idea about a topic, finds a research article, and uh, knows it, and then at the end of this research article, there's sort of a clear statement, and good articles have that, where, where the authors of that paper, of that research article, say what they didn't do and what the next steps would be. Yeah. Then you can basically start there and stand on the shoulders of giants and make a contribution. Okay, but also it's just uh, good practice. You know, uh, the thing is, you need, to give, uh, you need to do your homework and you need to give credit where credit is due. Now that's actually quite important in the academic discipline. We, you know, we don't, we don't get money for publishing research or whatnot. We get this, it's a very real system where we have our own currency, which is our citations. You know, how many people, I don't know, think that my work is great, you know? Uh, I don't know, uh, that's sort of what, what kind of counts, or how many other people cite you and use you as a reference in their work that they do. That's sort of like the, the currency in the academic business. But it's also just really good practice, you know, to give credits where credits are due. Yeah. So somebody had some ideas, you need to give credits to that. You know, if somebody found something, you need to give credits to them. And that's sort of where the citations come into play that I'm going to talk about um, later on during this lecture. Okay, so that's basically a literature review. Yeah, and you had a reading about that. You now it's, uh, it's about summarizing the existing research. But you don't want to just summarize whatever you find. You know, like that's actually a big mistake that people often make. Um, uh, and then they get lost very quickly because there's just so much out there. But you actually want to be much more, much more specific and use the literature review to help you in answering your question. Now, that's always my advice to students. Use the literature review to help you to answer your question. If it doesn't help you to answer your question or it's not relevant to answer your question, then you should put it in your literature review. Okay, but more about that now. Now I talk about five steps how you do this literature review and, and filtering and kind of focusing in sort of an important context in that regard. So let me talk about five steps on how to do a literature review or what are the things that are important in this regard. So there are sort of five steps that I have here. Uh, first, you define your topic clearly, you know, uh, then you uh, you do the actual search. I'm going to show you how you actually do it or what you're going to do. And nowadays, as I said, it's, it's becoming much easier through the internet. You know, through libraries, they have online resources that you can actually access, access from home, um, which makes it much easier. But then you also need to filter your results. You, know, you need to condense it somehow. You need to analyze it. You know, now we're not talking about data. Yeah? Now we're talking about the literature. So this is all like still dealing with the existing literature. And then you need to write that up somehow. Yeah? And, um, and writing that up is, is, is almost like a little research article in itself. But let me talk about each one of these five now, five points now in a little more detail. Yeah. So the first thing is, when you do a literature review, you need to have a clear topic. You need to have a clear area that you're looking at. If, if you come to me and say you want to do a literature review on sociology, that's not going to work. What do you need to do? You know, there are kind of tons of books out there. There are tons of research articles every year. 
they are more, uh, it's not going to fly. So you need to have a clear topic or research question, which is why I, I dedicated a whole lecture on this in the first instance. Yeah? Because if you don't have a research question, it's not going to, it's not going to work out. Yeah? So you need to have a very precise question on an area that you want to, want to uh, study or that is relevant for the question that you have. And the more precise your research question area already is, the better you can define the topic of your literature review. So it's, at the end you have like, you zoom in with specific keywords. And, uh, but sometimes you, know, you, you, you first start very narrow and then you see what you find and then you can zoom out again and be more general. For example, you know, I have this one research project, as I said, where we look at um, obesity and social networks, and what we are more specifically interested in is homophily. Homophily is a phenomenon that your friends are incredibly similar to you. Right? When you just look around, just look at the people that you know. Uh, most of them are in the same age category as you. Most of them have similar interests than you. Most of them, I don't know, we can, we can go down uh, political party alignments, opinions, attitudes. Yeah. Uh, of course there are also people that are very different from that, but, but the people in your network, they will be more similar to you than a completely random person in the population. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our worlds, our social networks are incredibly structured. So in my world, most of my friends, they have a PhD. Right? It's like a driving license, which is all I have one. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, it's not, it's not a big thing. It's, 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 I don't know, because almost everybody had it. Yeah? And the reason you already see where this is coming from, and that's exactly the kind of stuff that one can study, is uh, that most of my friends I met at the university. Yeah? Like you guys sitting together, talking, sometimes during the lecture. <laughs> and then, uh, and then um, I just got to know them and we became friends. Yeah. But now, my network is incredibly structured. Right? Or, I know lots of people from the US, lots of Americans, but I don't know anybody who voted for Trump. Well, maybe they don't say it, but uh, you see, again, there's another bias happening in here. That the people that I, most of the people, uh, most of the Americans I know, I met them over here in Europe, while they are abroad, and often it's a particular kind of Americans that kind of tend to study abroad. You know, they are sort of, I don't know, more, more cosmopolitan to begin with, in a while. And there you see another effect, you know, like how our networks can be incredibly structured. So actually, a lot of my work is, is about that. Technically speaking, we call that homophily. And uh, you know, in this particular research project with this student, I'm looking at obesity homophily right now. You know, like why is it actually we do find it that uh, the friends of overweight people tend to be overweight as well, right? or the friends of underweight people tend to be underweight as well. But now this is our research area. Yeah? And when we now start this research project, we need to check the scene first. What did other people research? What did other people write in that context already about? So I have a search key at the end of the day, obesity homophily, and I look for that. If I don't find anything about that, then I zoom out. Then I look at maybe health and social networks. If I don't find anything there, then I zoom out even more. So that's sort of what I mean by starting very precise and then kind of zooming out. It's much easier to start precise and zoom out than to do it the other way around. And if you don't have a precise research question area, you know, just go back and read and think about a good research question. It's not worth it. You're going to get lost. So really have a very precise and very good research question. Okay, so um, well, the different strategies how you can go about that now, but let me jump over that and talk about how you actually then search stuff. Yeah. So now imagine we have an idea, you know, I want to study this, this, I want to have this, start this research project about social networks and, and health outcomes or obesity more specifically. You know, how do I go about this? Well, one really good starting point is nowadays the internet. You know, believe it or not, the internet knows almost everything. So it's incredibly uh, resourceful, and sometimes it's hard to imagine how did people do these things like, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, without the internet. Well, there was a lot more legwork involved, to be honest, but at the same time, there was also a lot of redundancy, because they didn't really find that somebody else already worked on something. You know? So nowadays, it's much easier for us to find other people's work through the internet. So actually that can be a, a big advantage. So I'm arguing very much in favor of this because um, it really allows me to identify what somebody wrote about uh, social networks and health inequality in New Zealand, for example. 
or in South Africa or something like that. Right? Before, without uh, having the proper means to search for it, I could miss that easily. Yeah. And we, let's be honest, we're still going to miss a bunch of stuff. Yeah. But uh, we are less likely to miss important things. To miss important things. Okay, so the internet is actually a good starting point. You know, seriously, it's just, just Google stuff. Um, there's one caveat though. Yeah. The internet has all these wonders. Yeah. It's all this stuff that you find. Uh, it's sometimes cute, it's sometimes funny, and whatnot. Yeah. But is this credible? Yeah. So that's sort of now the challenge nowadays for you guys. You know, to kind of develop that because it's not that straightforward anymore. It used to be a okay, well, K1 in the library, the journal articles. It's sort of like the credible source, right? But now everything seems to be in the internet. How do you how do you distinguish the real stuff from the bullshit? Yeah. So that's sort of like a like an important uh, 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 an important issue to, to deal with when you do your literature research. So there are a few strategies. There are a few strategies how you can get around that, and I'm going to talk about uh, them now. Well, first of all, the university offers incredibly good internet services. The library offers incredibly good internet services. Believe it or not, but UCD Library has a really good internet service. They have what they call UCD One Search. It's like a search engine, but it's a search engine for academic and scholarly work. So there you really have some, um, uh, 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 some, some guarantees that it's not something somebody made up in the internet, you know, but it's actually based on academic journals, academic publications, and so on. So that's a very, very good starting point. So and part of the part of the assignment for next week is going to be just that. Either you will have to do a search, I give you a little task to search something through uh, the online services that you see So there's this one search which is the starting point, but there's a lot of other stuff, you know, like catalogs, e-journals, digital library. You know, it's actually worth browsing around that kind of stuff if you haven't done so yet. Another thing, let me just mention that they have uh, an incredible amount of databases. So um, you, you can go there, for example, there's the Irish Newspaper Archive, which gives you any published newspaper article in Ireland for the last, I think it's 70 or 80 years. Every newspaper article is in that, in that database. So if you want to know, what did people talk about? Actually, this is an interesting source for research too. Uh, you can look at, uh, uh, you can do a content analysis. You can analyze uh, the topics that people dealt with at certain times, you know, how they reacted to something like that. But that's just one of the databases that they have. They have a whole bunch of other databases. And they also among these other databases, there are also some, some search databases. And I'm going to talk about three of them now in more detail. Yeah. So you have the OneSearch option in, in UCD, which sort of is one way to, to search the library catalog and they linked it now with journal articles too. So that's sort of why it's a good starting point. But there are a bunch of other ones that are um, relevant and very useful. So, if you would cl click your way through that, you know, the database is one of it is called the Web of Science. Web of Science is a huge database of uh, scholarly articles, of journal articles, and so on. It's basically, again, like a Google for, uh, for, for academic research. And uh, sometimes it's useful. I use, it's a bit like using different search engines. You know, they, they give you sometimes slightly different results, or they prioritize things differently, or the one misses out on that. That's sort of why when I do this, I kind of look at different sources as well. So the web of science is one that I look at. So you type in your search key, and you get a, some result about it. Yeah. Another one is called sociological abstracts. Again, it's under UCD library, uh, the, the, one, the, the, the database section. So again, it's like a. Like a, like a search window that you type in your search key here, typed in obesity, homophily, and then you see I get some results. Yeah? So the first one would be homophily and contagion as explanations for weight similarities among adolescents' friends, which sounds highly relevant for what I want to study. Yeah? And then I see the reference, you know, written by guys, uh, Kala, uh, Robbins, Moore, Wilson, it was published in the Journal of Adolescent Health in 2011 with the details, with the page numbers, and so on. And then I can actually click on one search here, and that would, think, would get me to this article. Yeah. So that that's, makes our life much, much easier. Before, I would have to think about where would people publish these kind of things, browse through those journal articles or those whole journals, yeah, and then uh, be lucky and find stuff. But here I can find things. Sometimes it's more relevant, sometimes it's less relevant. Another source that, to be honest, and I'm using quite a lot, is actually Google Scholar. Yeah, it's incredibly good. 
Nowadays, Microsoft has a, its own version too, but Google Scholar is incredibly good as well. You know, they do know how to search stuff. So, uh, you know, here I typed in, here I typed in, uh, again, the search key, obesity homophily, and now you see, now I get different, different results. Well, actually, when you look at the third one, the third one is the one that we also found in the, in the web of science before, this article homophily and contagion, its explanations and so on. And uh, this is sort of how Google Scholar would look like. And again, yeah, kind of, you see the reference or some of the first paper was published by Damon Centola in Science 2011. And then at the bottom of it, you also see cited by, which is nice because now I kind of get an indication for what did other people think are the relevant works. Yeah. So in other articles, they cited and I'll come back to citation in a second, and then you understand what I mean by that. So other people made a reference to this article in their research. And then you could say, well, if a lot of people make references to that, that seems to be a relevant, seems to be a relevant piece of work that we need to deal with somehow. Yeah. It can be sometimes dangerous to then forget about works that wasn't cited that often, right? and then it can actually get lost, yeah? and then some really good work just doesn't get cited, and then nobody sees it, and because of that, nobody cites it. So there can be like this amplification happening, and actually it happens a lot in, in the academic business, uh, that some articles just become popular because they are popular becoming even more popular, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it's a very good way of kind of uh, getting an eyeball first. Okay, what are, this, what are the things that actually I, I really have to read here? Yeah. So if some, if some article has been cited a lot, you really have to engage with it. You cannot just ignore it. So that's uh, uh, three, three databases you know, that are very practical to identify a research topic. So let's say at some point you want to do a research project, you have an idea about it, you go to Google Scholar, you type it in, and then you see what is the relevant research. And then you can click on it, and then you, oftentimes you get a, get a link to it, or sometimes to the paper. That's sort of the nice thing about uh, doing it through UCD one search, because there you can actually get a link to the paper directly, uh, to the article, and then you can read it. Okay. So when you do this kind of thing, and uh, um, th so, so that's sort of one way, kind of looking at what, what does Google tell you? Uh, basically, it searches it based on keywords, you know, basically scanned all the documents, and so on. But what I often, often do as well, it's what is called a spider search. Uh, so I uh, kind of I identify one important piece of work, or a couple of important pieces of works, through one of those search engines. Yeah. And then I basically, Look at who do they cite. If there's a paper about, you know, um, it's coming back to the original example that we had with uh, social inequalities and health in Ireland. Uh, so let's say I want to study that. And then I find this article that looked at social uh, uh, inequalities and health in New Zealand. Right? Chances are that this guy in New Zealand already looked at the literature that is relevant uh, in that particular context. So basically, then I find the important piece of work, or the, a key publication, uh, and then I look at who are being cited in that key publication. And then I kind of, I branch out. Yeah? And then I branch out even more, and even more. And, and you do that with a bunch of different starting points. Very quickly, you create a, a web of how things are connected, and who cites whom. And then you can see, uh, uh, you can, you can, it's another way of finding stuff. But it's very, it's very useful, especially when you're sort of lost with this, yeah? because when you have a new research project, especially when you, when you do this for the first three times, you're just completely <laughs> lost because you have no idea about what is important, what is not important. Well, it's very difficult to have that. So a spider search can be very, very useful in this regard. Okay, but let me give you a few helpful tips. So when you do a literature uh, um, search, uh, start with what we call annual review articles or handbook articles. What are these? Well, basically we have a journal, and we have all these research journals, and I don't know, and, and we try to get to publish in that. It's actually not that easy to, to publish in these journals because people reject you or you have to, I don't know, fulfill certain criteria and so on. So it's actually, for some of them, it's incredibly difficult. And one of them, there's a series, it's called the Annual Review of Sociology. There's also the Annual Review of Psychology. There's also the Annual Review of Economics, I think. Yeah. So basically, in these in these journals, basically some prominent figures in the field, in whatever field, let's say social inequality and health, are being asked to summarize the state of the art. 
That's basically what it is. It's just a review article. There's no, there's no uh, new research in there. It's just summarizing the state of the art, like putting a milestone on where are we right now? What are sort of the questions that we need to look at? Which is why these journal articles are a very good starting point. The same for handbooks. Handbooks are basically often thick books that are too expensive for you to buy. So that's sort of why you go to the library. I like handbooks with the same mission. There's a handbook of, um, there's a handbook of migration. Yeah. And that's sort of like scholars in, who study migration in sociology. They came together and they kind of looked at uh, all different aspects of it and people wrote different summary chapters about that. Yeah. Or there's a handbook, for my field, there's a handbook of analytical sociology, you know, where kind of important people in the field kind of came together, put a, book, a thick book together with different chapters about different aspects and they summarize these different aspects. Okay, um, second advice, start with the most recent literature on topic question and look at their literature reviews. Basically walk your way backwards. The idea is if you start with, uh, you remember if you start with, if you find an important piece of work and then you look at what this per who this person cited in the bibliography at the end of the research article, you only find the existing work that existed at this particular moment. So if I find an important piece of work that was published in 2000, then the, and I look at, okay, who, who is being summarized in this research article yeah, by this person, uh, but then only stuff is in there that was written before 2000, so I'm missing out on everything ever since. Yeah. So that's sort of the reason why you should start with the most recent one and then kind of work your way backwards, because otherwise you don't see stuff because it just didn't exist at the time. Okay, identify one or two key publications and make a spider search from that. You know, that's sort of always my recommendation, find one, one piece of work and then kind of use that as a starting point and, and branch on. But this is quite a lot, this is quite a lot. So what you need to do, so very quickly, you know, type something in Google search and you get 10,000 entries. What are you going to do with that? You can't impossibly, you can't impossibly read through all 10,000 articles. Yeah. So you need to filter this somehow. You need to evaluate this somehow. And why do you need to do that? Well, also because there's a whole lot of rubbish out there. So nowadays, I don't know, being published doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. There's an awful amount of crappy journals out there. So it's not just when somebody comes along and tells you, okay, I published this piece of work, that this is good. And you cannot really bank on that. So uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's really, really bad. So what are sort of strategies to find the good stuff? How can you find good research? Well, one is uh, look at the syllabus. Yeah. Guys like me, or probably even more older dudes with even bigger beards, they um, put a syllabus together. So then you can, you can draw on them. So when you kind of start a new research, so actually a very good starting point for if you want to study, let's say, health inequalities and uh, um, or social inequalities in health in Ireland, yeah. look at a syllabus where somebody teaches health inequalities. And then you kind of see, okay, this is sort of the relevant piece of his work, or this is sort of like important stuff. You know, this is not complete bullshit, you know, because somebody actually thought about that. What we do have, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, um, nowadays uh, the publishing business works through journals, through journal articles. You know, and there's a whole bunch of journals out there. But actually there's a, there's a, there's a different journals are regarded in different ways. So, for example, if you publish something in Nature or Science, you know, that's kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the ultimate thing to do. Yeah? While in sociology, it's actually we have very clear top journals as well. It's the American Journal of Sociology, we call it AJS, and we have the American Sociological Review, ASR. Yeah? So this is sort of where, where the top stuff is. So if a guy like me wants to get tenured in Ivy League University, that's what I have to do. I have to publish in those journals, it's very clear. Yeah? And when you read those journal articles, you often see why. Because that's the really good stuff. You know, that's very solid. That's really, really good. You know? But then there are also discipline journals. You know, for example, in my field, it would be social networks. That's sort of like the discipline pop journal that, uh, where, where we publish our research, where we communicate with each other. You know? So um, you have all these journals. And in order to get sort of an idea about which one are good ones or bad ones, there's something called an impact factor, journal impact factor. When you Google some journals, you, know, you often see a number with it, like the impact factor. And I think for the American Journal of Sociology is 4.5 or something like that. While for, um, let's say for Nature, it would be, I think, 30 or so. And so it's much higher. But it's also more general. It's basically like how often, how, how important is that? What's sort of the impact of articles in that, in that journal? As a way of kind of 
getting to that idea of what are good and, and what, are, what are bad journals. So some people are skeptical towards these impact factors. I think it's uh, the, the um, of course, I don't know, there can be some crappy piece of work in a good journal article or the other way around often as well. You know, just because an article was published in a crappy journal doesn't necessarily mean that the article is completely bullshit as well. But uh, in general, it's a very good indication. It's a very good indication. So when a student comes to me with a list of research articles, I tell them first, okay, look at the important journals here. Yeah. And that's sort of stuff that you might not really know yet, but you can actually Google what is the ranking of journals. And finally, if you start doing that, you kind of see who are the good academics and who are the bad academics. Because the bad academics, they hardly manage to publish something in some good journals. So, um, of course, then they argue that these journals don't matter, you know, or that the impact factors don't matter, but they do so because they don't get their sheet together and get into it. So, um, anyway, so journal impact factors, there's also uh, how, do you, how do you do that with books? Yeah, that's another thing. Sometimes because a book is published, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's great. Yeah. And there's actually a whole bunch of really weird and crappy publishing houses out there. They're quite obscure. Right? And um, how can you get around that? Well, one way of getting around that is actually to go to the prestigious uh, publishing houses. And these are clearly the university presses. So I don't know, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, you know, Princeton. They have sort of like the university presses. I think UCD, we have one as well. But let's be honest, UCD press is not, not the best place. Uh, so the other ones that are sort of better here. Yeah. So that's another why, because there's sort of a more rigorous process of people getting into that. Why? Because it's so prestigious, right? Because people actually want to get in there. So there are more people going for that. And they have these security measures in place. Well, other, other some obscure publishing houses, they don't have that. OK. But another thing, you know, I mentioned the citation network. And actually, people study these kind of things, like who cites who. Yeah? And then you can, you can really map that as a network, like one person citing another person, this person cites another person, this person cites another person, and, and, and so on. Yeah? And you can map that out, and through that, you can then actually identify which are the important ones, or which are sort of the ones that everybody seems to cite. Yeah? And that also gives you an indication that there's something in this journal that I actually should look at. Maybe it's particularly good, or maybe it's particularly controversial, or, or whatnot. Yeah. Okay, so the fourth step, and I want to get to those five points and then the citation probably we'll do next week. Um, so the fourth step, uh, you need to analyze. You need to analyze the literature. How do you do that? Well, you take notes on the literature while you read. Well, actually, when I read something, I paraphrase the findings already. You know? People work differently, and they actually there are no rules. Yeah? Some people keep Excel sheets. Yeah? Some people just have this phenomenal memory and can remember everything that they read. You know, I need to I need to organize stuff a little bit. Yeah? And often it's exactly how it looks in my office. And I'm sitting there and I have all this stuff on my floor yeah? or in my apartment. It's just a bit crazy, and then you wonder what what is this guy doing? But then at some point it comes to me. Right? Then I sort of make the connections in here. But people work differently on, on that way. But you need to. You need to synthesize the, and, and the findings already. So what, I, what in my experience, paraphrasing stuff as you read already helps. Because otherwise you read something and then you read something else and you forgot what you read in the first instance. So that can, that can happen very easily. So the fifth point is in this literature review process, you have to write the actual literature review. You see, you still haven't done anything. You still haven't written well. You still have done a lot of things, but you haven't really written anything. Yeah? So how do you write a literature review? And actually, you know, there's actually a good advice for writing an essay as well. So uh, when you write a research essay or even an exam question, when you answer that, it makes a lot of sense to have a very clear structure in there. So when I, why is that? Because if somebody is just blabbering around, it takes so much, so much cognitive energy that I need to put into that to understand what you're, what you're talking about. Well, when you have a clear structure in that, it comes much more natural to me. Yeah? And uh, so when you write a literature review, you even have come walk back to that data stage as well, how you, how you basically set up a whole research project in a way, but even within the literature review, you have an introduction you know, that gives a quick idea of the topic of the literature review and the central themes and how you organize it. Then you contain a discussion of the sources and either organize them chronologically, thematically, or methodologically. And uh, at the end, you have a conclusion recommendations, discuss what you have drawn from the review, from the literature that you've reviewed so far and, and where might the discussion proceed. So it's almost like a little mini paper in it, in itself. So um, that's the literature review. I have more stuff about citations, but I think I'm going to push that to, uh, to uh, next week. 
but uh, you have an assignment about that as well, and there are instructions on that, and there's a link to the citation style. And uh, so, in terms of readings, there we go. So next week, uh, because I'm going to catch up on some of this stuff, also the research design, and so there's no reading for next Sunday. Yeah. Okay.